Um, good afternoon. What a very nice turnout we have today. I'm very, very pleased. Um, my name is Trudy O'Connell. Um, and on behalf of Brookfield Invisible, I want to welcome you to our first big public program. And we've chosen climate change as our first big program, which is very much in the news. I just want to tell you a very brief amount about Brookfield Indivisible for those of you who do not know. Um, we formed this past winter a uh, number of people who were interested in becoming more active citizens. Um, that's, after all, the key to a democracy is having active citizens. So, and our mission is to advocate for legislation and programs at all levels of government that protect the rights of everyone to education, health care, a safe and clean environment, and equal economic opportunity. Uh, we're not affiliated with any particular political party, uh, and we welcome all to join us as we educate ourselves about the very important issues we have in our country and in our world today. So uh, we all want to get reacquainted for those who used to be acquainted and acquainted for those who never have with grassroots kinds of action. Um, sometimes change has to come from the bottom up. Um, there's a sign up sheet by the table uh, for signing in and, and if you left your email there we'll be happy to include you in our mailing list for all things Brookfield Invisible. Um, our next meeting, we do have regular meetings, will be August 13th. We'll be meeting over at the Brookfield Inn right across Route 9 from the Brookfield Common at 2.30. And we would be delighted to have all of you join us. Our first speaker today is Ann Gobi, who is our state senator from Worcester, Hamden, Hampton, Hampshire, Middlesex. Uh, probably has the longest uh, title of any senator. <laughs> After 12 years as a representative, uh, Senator Gobi ran for Senate, and she's now in her second term. Um, the district, I want you to appreciate the size of the district that she represents. It runs all the way from the Connecticut border to New Hampshire, and it includes 29 zip codes. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that she's taken out time today from for to be with one of those zip codes or several, <laughs> several that are represented here, um, we really appreciate. Um, among many other committee responsibilities that Senator Gobi has, she is chairperson of the Joint Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. So our topic today is right up her alley. Uh, and we appreciate her taking time to be with us today and give us an update on the Commonwealth's efforts in the area of climate change. Senator Gobi. Okay. I will. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> teacher talk. Teacher talk. He is a teacher, you know. Yeah, that, 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 uh, we still, I still have my teacher voice. Nice to see everybody, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, Brookfield Indivisible has definitely reached a lot of folks. When you look around this room, you see people from, from Spencer and Hardwick and, and Ware and West Brookfield and all the way from Australia. <laughs> How about that? There you go. <laughs> what, what, I thought, what I'd like to do is that I was going to kind of just give a little bit of update on a few things that are going on at the State House right now. Somebody else, come on in. Come on in. Um, some of the things that are going on, and then uh, obviously, they, no problem. Just keep, keep coming in. That's good. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. To have too many people. Welcome yeah. to China. Excellent. <laughs> A <laughs> um, couple things I, I did want to just mention real briefly. Actually, uh, my committee, the Committee on the Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture, we actually just had an extremely um, sad loss. Last Saturday, my House Chair of the Committee passed away very unexpectedly, Gail Ann Critty from North Adams. And when I was driving up to her services on Wednesday evening, I was thinking about, Gail was so excited. This was the first time that she was a chairperson of a committee to be named to this committee. She was ex so thrilled. And we were talking about our districts one day. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, Gail, because I have the Quabbin Reservoir, I provide all the clean water for the state of Massachusetts. She said, well, yeah, I can talk that. She said, I represent North Adams. We provide all the clean air. So, <laughs> But that's how she was, and, it, and it's, a, it's a tragic loss for the committee. The, one of the other reasons I wanted to bring that up, because the speaker will now be naming a new house chair, and it may be a couple of weeks, so because of that, 
my committee we are not having any hearings at this time until a new house chair is named and so it's kind of put us back a little bit um, uh, we have a very aggressive schedule typically I have about 350 bills in that committee we've already had uh, three hearings and we had intended to have uh, a couple others this month a couple others next month so we'll see how things go with that one positive that happened um, the one bill that Gail was very much come on in that Gail was very much in favor of you know in 2008 Massachusetts passed the Global Warming Solutions Act and are you familiar with that? I know that, Glenn, you're probably going to talk about that anyway. We can talk a little bit about that afterwards. Uh, so Massachusetts knows, knew how, understands how important it is for climate change and global warming. And so we had passed an act saying basically that we're going to try to cut emissions by 20% by 2020 and by 80% by 2050. One of the things, though, about that, which is interesting about that, is that there really wasn't pl any specific plan in place to implement all that. So this past session, Mark Pacheco is a senator from Taunton, and Mark, if some of you, uh, Mark, Mark, I tell people that he was green before green was cool. You know, he's been green forever. Come on in, come on in. Um, and Mark filed a bill that came into my committee that we exact out and is on its way to the Senate. And that bill is an implementation of the Global Warming Act. And the, and the implementation would be this. Is that so that we're not only just thinking about 2020 and 2050, but what happens in between them? So in these next couple of years, the idea is that the state really is put their nose to the grindstone and say, we're going to come up with some other benchmarks to make sure that we reach them by 2025, by 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045, leading up to 2050. Because we don't want to see any slip back. You know, it's nice enough to say you're going to do 20% by 2020, 80% by 2050. But what happens in between there, those 30 years? You're going to have an opportunity where things are going to spike back up again. And we don't want to see that. Uh, the other part of that, I know a lot of you have, a, have interest in, again, I know the doctor will speak about on the carbon pricing. There are two bills that, uh, on carbon pricing. They had a public hearing on Wednesday. I was at, uh, excuse me, on Tuesday. I was at that hearing. It went for about five and a half hours. Um, uh, on specifically on those two on those two bills and as you can imagine about 90 percent of the folks that came up to testify were in favor of the bill usually what happens it's not unusual when people know that there is a bill that's coming up that there are a lot of people in favor of the opposition folks will stay away because it, it, you know they they know the, what, what sort of the climate is no, no pun intended of the room and so they will tend to maybe stay away on things like that what and and I'm not going to tell you that that's going to be an easy sell with things with carbon pricing uh, just to look at the political climate you know that a couple of years ago the legislature we tried to put in a, a gas tax to pay for infrastructure and as soon as we put it in it went to the ballot box and it was as quickly repealed by very large numbers especially in my Senate district so to talk about a carbon pricing, and you can call it pricing, you can call it a fee and not a tax, you're gonna be paying more. And when people see that, it's a hard sell. One thing that's in Senator Pacheco's bill that we put out is to take a look at the largest polluters in Massachusetts and say to those large polluters, you're gonna pay more. You're gonna pay more if you want me meeting what you're supposed to be doing to come under for the emissions. And personally, I think that that's a good way to at least start the conversation and to get at things. So that bill has passed through committee, is currently in the Senate, and I'm not sure how quickly we'll take it up. I know when I spoke with Senator Pacheco on Thursday, um, you know, he's hoping that it's something that we'll be able to take up maybe as soon as, hopefully in September, that we'll take it take it up that, that quickly. So I did want to make sure that you kind of knew that that bill was out there. And um, again, looking at some of the big polluters in Massachusetts and what we can do about that. On Thursday, I was talking to Ann over here, and we were saying that when we talk about things with global warming and climate change, that you really have to look at it in a holistic way. And what's happening with those emissions? Give you one example. On Thursday, we passed, a, we've been working on the marijuana bill, and the Senate passed a version of that on Thursday. One of the amendments that I had, and unfortunately did not pass through, was to take a look specifically on the energy that it's going to take to run these marijuana facilities, these growing facilities. The energy usage that they have for the electricity and water usage is off the charts. Yeah. And when it was still illegal in Colorado and California, 
the, the way that the police were trying were tracking who was doing um, illegal operations, they looked at the spikes on the on the electricity spikes. <laughs> That's how they did it. It was that much. Three three percent for the state of California. Three percent of it is the marijuana. Bed. I mean. That's big, and and we and so when we talk about looking at things in this kind of holistic way, we really don't know what that's going to mean for Massachusetts with that with the energy usage and kind of going forward for some of the, um, these facilities. Which was another reason that and again I don't want to get too far off of this, but I also had filed some amendments for our small farmers uh, because typically these growing operations and the way that the bill passed at the ballot box was they have to be inside, and all contained inside, which is the reason that you have the lights and the high energy and the more water and blah, 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 blah. And so I'm trying to do things for smaller farmers so that you could grow outside. And uh, so anyway, we'll see, we'll see what happens with that. But I, but I did kind of want to make you aware of that as well. We also have a number of bills in committee. Um, one right now uh, for the plastic bags. A lot, of, a lot of communities are doing their own plastic bag bans. And when I've met with folks from the plastic bag industry, they actually would rather see a statewide ban because for them it would be easier than this piecemeal town by town by town, city by city. And, and they all have different ones about what, what they will have for a bag, if it's going to be totally compostable, uh, the, how thick the plastic has to be. So they would rather see a complete statewide ban on it. So uh, we have passed that out of committee the past few years, and unfortunately it has not passed through the, it's passed through the Senate, has not passed through the House. We'll see what happens, and I think again, because when we, when we look at these bills that come up, we do take a look at what they're doing for the environment, but we also have to look at the bottom line and what it's doing to businesses as well, and to make sure, we've got to get the business community on, on board with a lot of these things, to make sure that they support things that are, that are the right thing to do for the environment. Um, and can obviously affect their bottom line, but the idea is that to show them, to show the, to show the business community that by doing this, doing these things that are good for the consumers, doing these things that are good for our communities, <coughs> will help your business, will help you. And you know, we've got Al Alex here from the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm sure you have these conversations with folks in, in your chambers, and it's very important to make sure that our Chambers of Commerce are kind of on, on um, line with things. Um, I had made a couple other quick notes that I just wanted to make sure I didn't want to forget about. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things I don't agree with Governor Baker about, but I was very happy that he did make sure that after the president pulled out of the Paris Accord, that he said Massachusetts would stay to those goals. And I, and I did congratulate him when I saw him shortly after that, and I did thank him for that because that was extremely important. The other thing that was under the radar a little bit too is that he signed an executive order back in the fall and it had to do with helping uh, cities and towns to plan for uh, catastrophic climate events. And some of the first funding is coming out for that. Uh, Charlton, Spencer, and Ware were three of the first towns to get some money to be able to hire someone to look at long-term plans in their communities to plan for these catastrophic events. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more communities getting involved in that. But that's where it has to start. I think we, I think we all are very well aware that of what's going on at the federal level, whether it's the cuts to EPA that are for, that. that the states, our local communities, are really going to be on their own for a lot of these things. And it, it's going to be so necessary to look at what we can do locally, what we can do as a state, and we're not going to be able to count on, at least for now, for, for some of these federal monies and some federal supports coming in. And that's why groups like this are so important, to get the conversation going, to see what, what makes sense, where we can be helpful, what we can do. The other thing that I'm working on right now is working with our farmers. Uh, there, with, with climate change, soil, the importance of soil, and making sure that we're doing things for agriculture because, of course, when we had that drought last year, and if you know folks around here that were growing peaches and their peach crops were, 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 were gonzo, and so farmers are now looking at things that they can do to make sure uh, that they're going to have some sustainability as well. Unfortunately, what sometimes happens with farmers, and, and it's not their fault, is that they look sometimes at the, at the short term, bless you, you know, of what they can make in this growing season because it's so difficult to keep going and farming. And sometimes to look out 10 or 15 years, what might be the best thing, maybe sometimes cost prohibitive at that time. So I'm working with uh, NOFO, which is the Organic Farmers Association for Massachusetts. And NOFO is doing a lot with this Healthy Soils Initiative 
We have a bill that's filed on the state level. California recently fought, um, passed a bill, and I think, I want to say Maryland may have uh, filed one as well. And again, it would be to have some, some assistance to agriculture, to our farmers, uh, to do healthy soils, to make sure that they are planting things on the soils, uh, are ready to maintain as much moisture as possible so we're not having to use as much water. When you go through even as, as much water as we may have had this spring, as you go through towns, I mean in my town of Spencer, see the big billboard, the water restriction is in, in place until October. And you see those signs around and that's only going to exacerbate as things continue to change with, with climate change. Uh, the other big issue that we face in Massachusetts, because we're a coastal community, you know, we have almost 2,000 miles of coastline, you know, if you think about all the ins and outs of it. And uh, there's a lot of areas, uh, we were talking about this, you mentioned that's the same problem that you're having in Australia, but um, the erosion that's happening and trying to maintain seawells, the amount of money to maintain, and it's, it's it, and I'm not exaggerating, it's something like for 10 or 15 feet of seawall, it's like a million dollar price tag. Wow. You, it's it's off the charts of what you have to do when you're trying to to maintain the seawalls in our in our town in our areas. You know we think about local dredging projects at lakes, Lake Wickabaw. Now you know that that's on a very big lake, man-made lake, only 12 feet deep. They're looking to do a dredging project. It was a five million dollar price tag for dredging that. And if you don't do it, you know you're going to lose these things. You know, you're going to lose these, these water bodies. So there's a lot of things that, that tie in with, with climate change, with global warming. Obviously, emissions is the big one. The biggest thing is that we, we all, I, I don't know how, if, how many people walked here today. I know Beth did because she lives across the street. But, <laughs> but you know, we probably drove here, right? I mean, the biggest emissions are trucks and our cars are the biggest e emitters in, in Massachusetts. And we're trying to do things, too, looking at um, <coughs> to make sure that that rail is more accessible. Uh, we're working on a... Uh, uh, East-West Rail Initiative from Springfield to Boston. 1960, you could take the train from Springfield yep. to Boston and ran four times a day. Yep. Now, if you go to Palmer to the steaming tender restaurant, and you'll see the train goes by, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It's crazy. It's crazy. So we're trying, you know, and, and we look at what happens in, in Boston when they're looking to do a few miles of track and improvements for a, at a billion dollar price tag for two miles. And we're looking at 50 miles with tracks that are already there, and it would be some improvements for about a third of that, and they push it back, don't want to do it. Wow. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that we can talk about and to get involved in. I am going to say, I, I do apologize, because I have a couple quick graduation parties to get to, and David, you can't be late too. David and I play in the Quad Community Band, and we have to be there by 5.30, David, to set up. The band starts at 6, so if anybody's looking for anything to do, I'm Barry Common tonight, 6 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to leave some cards. I know you're going to put some questions, right? We're going to plan to have some follow-up afterward. And um, I want to thank the doctor, too. We, the Senate did uh, a conversation tour that we went around the state. And when we were in Worcester, did you go to another one besides Worcester? And Ashland. You did oh. the Ashland one, too. Um, and he, he was kind enough to do a, a nice presentation. And uh, a lot of what the good doctor said that night is part of a, a formal report. It's just going up online. So I want to thank you for that. So I'm going to leave. Um, I'm not going to leave my. <laughs> 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 I won't leave my Democrat kind of my license. <laughs> Um, this card, this card is more of my personal email rather than the state house one, just in case people sometimes want to put stuff about that have to do more with things that really shouldn't be on the state house um, email. So I'm going to leave some of these cards around as well. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, and yeah, as Senator Kobe mentioned, because we have a pretty ambitious program um, with Dr. Fry's presentation, we are we've left uh, some little squares of paper on table for if you have a question for Senator Kobe, we hope to schedule a, a follow-up meeting with her very soon, and we will be happy to present the questions. And if you leave your email on that question, we will get back to you with the answer to your question or what you just has responded. Um, I do want to mention, uh, Senator Gobi mentioned a number of pieces of legislation, and if any of those piqued your interest, 
it would be a good idea to formally let her know through a letter, email, or phone call, or other people who are on her uh, natural resources, uh, environment, agriculture committee, uh, et cetera, you can easily find that the Mass Legislature website was on what committee. Um, let them know what you're thinking, because it's important for them to hear from all of us. Otherwise, they're sort of operating in a vacuum, and maybe they don't hear all the points of view. So it would be good to be more activist. So anyway, um, today's, I just want you to know, today's program was, was well into the planning stages before President Trump decided to withdraw from the Paris Accord, um, the Climate Accord. Um, that decision, of course, put climate once again, where it should be every day. I'm told I can't be heard. I'm told I can't be heard. <laughs> All right, I'll do this. Um, it put it on the front pages again, where it should be every day, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and some people started wondering, well, gee, he's withdrawing. Is being in there a good idea or not? Well. Perhaps one, one answer to that is that all 195 other countries in the world are signatories to this agreement, and so it would seem that they can't all be wrong. Um, so uh, today, we hope this program is going to bring us all to a better understanding of the science and the economics of global warming. Uh, we're very pleased to have one of our own Brookfield Indivisible members, Dr. Jean Fry, to give us uh, the program today. Uh, Dr. Fry received his PhD from Cornell in resource economics. Uh, he worked as a policy and planning director for Maine Energy Office, uh, an economist in the Electric Power Division of the Massachusetts Utility Commission. Um, he is, was a contributing editor for climate change issues, issues for the Global Environment Change Report, and he managed energy efficiency program evaluations for Northeast Utilities. So he's been in the energy business for a long time. But for the past several years, and probably even more than that, Dr. Fry has devoted himself exclusively to the study of global warming climate change issues. He's made presentations at many conferences, both uh, domestically and abroad. He's testified before innumerable uh, legislative branches and, and committees, uh, both nationally and, and uh, statewide. And he has prepared a CD library of uh, resource articles which all of you have in front of you and are welcome to take home. He has so far distributed this um, CD of resources to 22,000 people. So he is doing an awful lot as a single person on this issue. And uh, we're very pleased to uh, have him here today. Uh, we will have time for questions and answers for Dr. Fry when he's done with his presentation. So um, if you want to jot those down. We're not going to interrupt him in the middle, but um, we will certainly take what time we need to answer questions afterwards. So uh, that being said, welcome Dr. Bryan. Thank you so much. Okay. A um, little bit more about me. I got involved in climate change for the first time in my house husband here. My wife went to a conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was babysitting for our a uh, son who was about two years old then. and uh, But she got in for one session, so I got to hear Carl Sagan, who some of you uh, know, uh, Al Gore, and the person who changed my life, David Ryan. David Ryan's boss was James Hansen. And uh, he's looking at once a century droughts covering 45% of the earth by the time we got doubled CO2, which they pegged at 2059. So, yeah, and I've been working on climate change in my spare time ever since then. And since I retired about six years ago, I get to work at it full time for negative pay. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a good arrangement. <laughs> and I should mention also that I, three, a little over three years ago, I discovered Citizens Climate Lobby, which is pushing all around the country for a national price on carbon. It's consistent with calls for international price on carbon by uh, oil companies especially, but also many others. And so I've had seven rounds of lobbying on Capitol Hill with 30 senators and congressmen, uh, in addition to a few here in the United States, in, in, at the state level. So, I uh, hope you like the title. Uh, what does our future look like? 
And I think the past is a good guide to our future, and that's uh, very important. And it's something which I wish the National Climate Assessment four years ago addressed uh, more than they did, which was zero, despite my comments. Okay, a few things that climate change affects us directly already. We're fairly well insulated from it in the United States. Uh, most of the effects are felt in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh and Iraq and across uh, a lot of Africa and also in Latin America, Philippines. They're feeling a lot more than we are. Trade jihad for food. <coughs> Syria and Iraq's 900 year drought fueled civil unrest and ISIS penetration, the refugee flow uh, to Europe, in my opinion, had a lot to do with the vote for Britain to leave the uh, common market, European Union. And it probably had a little bit to do with uh, electing Donald Trump, although that's more of a stretch. Now, most of you are aware of the greenhouse effect. And we have visible light coming in short wave, outgoing infrared radiation long wave. Greenhouse gases in the air intercept some of the outgoing radiation. If you put more greenhouse gases, they'll intercept more, although sometimes the molecules get in the way of each other, so it's not a simple linear thing. It's more of a curve linear thing. The most important thing to understand that uh, too many climate models don't is when you darken the earth, it absorbs more sunlight, and that heats it up. And when you lighten the earth, which is not happening a whole lot right now, uh, the reverse happens. Um, so that's my major critique of most climate models is they do not take enough account of the earth darkening. Oh, I wanted to say one other, one other uh, fast thing that I heard uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, summarizing climate change. Scientists agree, it's real, it's us, it's bad, but there's hope. And the last 40% uh, of this slow uh, slideshow is about things we can do. So how fast are we warming? Fastest since the dinosaurs. Where is the warming going? Almost all the warming is going into the oceans. Only about 2% is going into the air, and yet it's the air that we uh, care about. It's the air, the temperatures we look at. Are we having a record? It's the air temperature we're looking at. But most of the warming is going into the oceans. And here's a look back at the last 50-some uh, years. One of those little tick marks on the left equals 100 years of US energy use. <clears throat> so in the early part of that period, 1967 to 90, the oceans were absorbing 40 years worth of American energy use every year. Then it went up to 70 years per year and now it's up to 100 years of energy use every year being added to the ocean. And that's 17 times human energy use. And what that means <coughs> is that the oceans are gaining more heat energy every two years than all the energy humans have ever used cumulatively since the beginning of our species. That's a lot. The last 100 years, uh, some of that uh, we've been aware of climate change. 1.5 degrees Celsius warming at sea surface, 1.5 on land, 1.2 combined. It's uh, speeded up, especially in the last 20 years. At the 20 year rate, we'll pass 2 degrees on land surface in 2035, but it'll take a bit longer at the sea surface, It'll be later this century. That's relatively soon. Uh, we've set very ambitious goals in the Paris Climate Agreement. Extremely ambitious goals, I might add. Looking now at the temperatures at the air surface, these are five-year moving averages, so they're not as uh, jagged as ones you might have seen. <coughs> Red are the actual temperatures according to NASA. Blue is predicted, taking into account the two major greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane but also sulfates, which are a very important player in screening sunlight away before it ever gets to the Earth's surface, so they cool things off. You have a big volcano, like Krakatoa especially, it cools things off, and more recently at Pinatubo, similar effect. There's the equation in the blue line, all three things are highly significant. And the biggest uh, sulfate is not 
in fact, is not vulca <coughs> volcanoes, but our own industrial emissions. But those emissions are down a quarter since their peak almost 40 years ago. And that means part of the warming that we have observed uh, when combined with shrinking Arctic ice, almost 30% of the warming we've observed in the last 40 years is due not so much to our own greenhouse gases, but the feedback from the fewer sul industrial sulfates and shrinking ice. So, very important thing is what this does to water. Uh, here's my only uh, picture slide. And this comes from quite a few years ago. I thought it was pretty cute. De droughts are worsening, deserts are spreading. That's true already. And not as much in the United States as elsewhere. And the most important factor is evaporation. Evaporation is an extremely powerful thing. As you warm things up, evaporation increases. So we observe that rainfall becomes more variable. Wet places get rainier, dry ones get drier. Planet-wide, we get more rain. There's more water vapor in the air. Uh, few, less rain in the mid-latitudes, a lot more in the Arctic. And rain is more concentrated. We have more hours without rain, but when it does come, it's more intense. That's been observed, especially here in the Northeast US. We have longer, drier, hotter droughts, that has to do with changes in the jet stream, which has to do with the Arctic warming faster than the uh, Earth, equator, equatorial regions. Droughts are becoming more common. Once a century droughts are happening almost once a decade now. We had two in the same uh, decade in the Amazon rainforest. Once a millennium droughts, we've had three in the last 10 years, including one in the United States. The middle one drove a lot of warfare. How fast has the U.S. been warming? I've done, that's an area where I've done a good bit of research, and here's a summary of it. Over 40 years since 1975, 5.8 degrees Fahrenheit per century, averaged over most of the weather stations in the U.S. that don't have a lot of missing data. It's really speeded up very much in the last 20 years. First 20 years, there's not much signal there. So apply that to the breadbasket of the world. When does it get as hot as Las Vegas? Well. 2120, but Kansas and whole southern plains and the Rocky Mountains are warming faster than the rest of the U.S., so they're really on track for Salina 2088, Kansas a whole, a few years later. So now we're looking at the results from all 348 cities, including 330 in the lower 48. When do they get as hot as Las Vegas if, if things keep on the way they have been in the last 20 years? And that's a big if. I'm expecting a bit of acceleration up to about 2050, and then maybe some deceleration after that, but it depends on what happens with permafrost. So your soonest is Nevada, Texas, Arizona, no surprise, but Idaho, fourth one, there's a bit of a surprise for us. Kansas is fifth, Oklahoma, I'm sorry, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Colorado is warming very fast, most of the places, especially Denver, Pueblo, and uh, Colorado Springs. War a lot of very fast warming in Wyoming. They're not very warm now, but they're certainly warming fast, it's similar to Idaho. And Montana, Bozeman, Billings, and Missoula especially, and Butte. 2160 something is about average for the United States as a whole. Uh, California has two very fast warming cities and two that aren't warming at all, and a lot of other cities. <coughs> New England is uh, a good place to be, and so is the Great Lakes area. That's where uh, it's going to be habitable the longest. What this tells us is we need to do a lot to keep this from happening. And bringing up the rear, Alaska. Maybe it's been warming a lot in the winter, but it's not been warming very much during the summer over those four years. I just looked at the summer. So what does the past tell us generally? <clears throat> well, looking back millions of years ago to when we had this much CO2 in the air is a really important thing to do. From what I've been able to find out, the last time we had more CO2 in the air, 14 million years ago, <coughs> Earth was 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, seas were a lot higher. They're almost this high, 
four million years ago, and when I gave this five years ago, I said, well, they've been this high four million years ago, but I can't really say that anymore. Sea level was a lot higher. That tells us there's a lot of lag effect to come. <coughs> Ice then was gone from almost all of Greenland, most of West Antarctica, some of East Antarctica. Losing that much ice is a slow process. It's measured more better in centuries than decades. But it shows us what our future will be like. Now looking at uh, scientific data from ice cores in Vostok, deep in the heart of Antarctica. And Al Gore, this is one of his favorite things, if anybody's seen it, Inconvenient Truth and so forth. So you, know, you notice that the CO2 at the top, methane or CH4 in the middle, and temperature at the bottom tend to move together. So what I'm going to do on the next page, and I originally did this for Amherst, Massachusetts seniors group a couple of years ago, uh, is to graph the top thing, which is CO2 concentrations, and the bottom thing, which is temperature, and I'm going to get rid of time. So here goes with that graph. <clears throat> on the vertical axis is temperature at Vostok in deep in Antarctica and CO2 concentrations across. And those are observations every 10,000 years and they're not 100% uh, correlated, but there's a pretty good correlation. On the right is an estimated translation from temperature changes in Antarctica to temperature changes globally. As many of you heard, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic are warming more rapidly than the world as a whole. So the green equation, which involves methane, explains almost 85% of the variation. But if you leave out methane and just look at CO2, you only explain 73%. So methane is important too, but you can't really throw it, show a three-dimensional graph. And those are consistent not only with what you have during the ice ages over the last 450,000 years, but over 4 and 14 million years. So you use those equations to what we have now, and you're looking at 7.8 degrees Celsius warming from current levels. Or if you neglect the methane, and maybe the methane will go away pretty quickly. It does have a short half-life, uh, measured maybe eight, 10 years. We could wind up with only five degrees Celsius warming from current CO2 levels. So that's a lot more than we've observed so far. And what that tells us is there's a lot of feedbacks and the feedbacks have to do with the Earth getting darker, which has what's happened when you replace ice covering the Arctic Ocean with water, which is a lot darker. Snow, when you melt snow, when you get rid of ice in Greenland and Antarctica. Also, when you get rid of sulfates in the air. Hmm. To hold global warming to the two degree target that's enshrined in Paris requires stopping carbon emissions removing two-thirds of what we put in there in the last 250 years and all of the methane. Methane's gone up much more rapidly than CO2, by the way. That means the Earth's remaining carbon budget, an idea popularized about four years ago, <coughs> instead of being we can emit carbon for a few more years or 10 or 20 more years at current rates, we passed the safe point a number of years ago. So before we talk about taking carbon out of the air and the many ways to do that, we're going to look a little bit more at our future. Temperature changes in the future by 2100 will be dominated not by our CO2 emissions, but by albedo changes, how much light Earth reflects, and in the later part of this century, emissions from permafrost and other natural sources. There are several others, but permafrost is the biggest. So what this tells us based on looking at the past and also the various factors involved, a number of scientists have done some studies about these. There are not lots and lots of studies about them, but a few. How much warming do we get from which things? Sulfur emissions, it's 0.6 per degree Celsius, similar for vanishing Arctic sea ice. Snow cover, 0.4. Land ice, 0 0.4, and that's by about 2,400. There's more after that. More water vapor. Water vapor is actually the most important greenhouse gas, and we talk about the effects of carbon dioxide. Uh, some of that's direct, but more of that's because we put more <coughs> water vapor in the air in a warmer world, courtesy of the CO2. So it's kind of a multiplier, and that applies not just to greenhouse gases, it also applies to 
warming from other reasons, changes in how much sunlight Earth reflects. And that's the rest of the 20% of the warming in the last 40 years is due to changes in how much Earth's, Earth reflects sunlight, and about 10% is the water mul vapor multiplier effect. And those effects are going to grow at the same time that human CO2 emissions from fossil fuels actually peaked five years ago. <coughs> They've been going down very slowly since then, and we're not sure it's an all-time peak yet, but probably is. And that's some of the good news. How much CO2 can we remove? Suppose we can remove a fourth of the carbon that we put in the air over the last 250 years. That's about half as much as we've lost from soils since agriculture began. So that's, uh, there are many ways to remove CO2. Mother Nature's also in the business of putting more CO2 in the air. Um, <coughs> so these are pretty much at the frontier. These are my estimates. Uh, this slide relies heavily on some research done at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, published in 2011. I think there's a very good chance we can phase out uh, CO2 from fossil fuels by 2050, but permafrost emissions will start to kick in then. They're sensitive not just to how much we emit, they're more, actually they're most sensitive to the temperature that is where they're at which is also affected by uh, changes in how much sunlight Earth reflects as well as our own emissions. So those are the best guesses that I have based on that piece of research. It's the only one that I know of that's really done something along those lines. Other people, are begin scientists are beginning to look at permafrost. And I've seen a couple of <coughs> estimates published in the liter literature, but it's still a very young field and in the draft national climate assessment in 2013 it was not addressed at all part of my climates part of my comments led to it being addressed in the final as a, another 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit celsius warming how does that translate into temperatures there are lots of uncertainties and but these are some best guesses if we stop cold turkey you're looking at the light blue line. If we base case and don't phase out until after 2100, our CO2 emissions are the red line on top. If we get rid of CO2 emissions by mid-century, which I think will happen, we're looking at the pink line. And if we take a lot of CO2 out of the air, we're looking at the dotted orange line. Um, I think the best measure I have is how soon does where get as hot as Las Vegas? I think if we, I think it's very much in our interest to remove most of the CO2 that we put in the air. And the sooner we can start doing that in spades, the better. <coughs> Consequences, these are drawn from a study almost 11 years ago, led by the World Bank's chief economist for the British government. <coughs> these are just selected effects. And they're pretty much baked in now unless we can remove most of the CO2 we put in the air by mid-century. And I think that's probably beyond us uh, to do it that soon. These are mostly things that we've already seen, but they're intensifying. As a matter of fact, climate change more generally, that's the case. Um, the one that concerns me, of course, most, I think, is the crop yields. Uh, you need food to feed people to support our pop population. Three degrees Celsius warming is also very difficult to prevent. Um, I think if we get started with massive enough CO2 removal soon enough, we can probably manage that. But here are some of the things from our study 11 years ago. <coughs> Again, we're seeing some of this already. Water wars in the Middle East, failed states, terrorists. Uh, they've had two once a century droughts in the Amazon. The dry season is getting longer, about one week per decade. The study came out four years ago. Extinction rates, hard to say, but we're already 100 times as fast as the background rate for mammals, maybe more. 
four degrees, a uh, little more speculative. I think we can avoid these damages if we get our act together very well. And this is kind of what I've dedicated my life to for the last 27 years. Entire regions cease agriculture altogether, Australia being the best known example of those. Uh, water wars become intense. Permafrost emissions accelerate more. Monsoons in India right now, sometimes the rain winds up in the ocean before it ever gets to the land. So here's the solutions. One, stop putting carbon in the air. Two, take it out. I think we're doing a pretty good job at number one. I think the chances are excellent that humans will no longer be putting carbon in the air by 2050. They're multitude of good signs, especially in China and India. Uh, we've got a bump in the road in the United States with Trump uh, right now, but that's short term and he cannot override market forces nor corporate America. So how do we stop putting carbon in the air? Let's talk about this in several families. The most important is to harness markets. That means us, America, getting involved politically. Congress needs to price carbon. A lot of people are telling them that. Massachusetts could price carbon, get Congress kick-started, jump-started, and CO2 emissions by 2050. Uh, here's my proposal, and other people uh, don't say two cents a pound, rising 12% a year. Often they rise, uh, some of them start higher, most of them start higher, and rise faster, but then stop rising. I still like mine, which is uh, a gradual move to a very high level, because mine doesn't really have an end date. The most important thing we can do is to have carbon tax credits for taking CO2 out of the air. That's not going to be enacted anywhere within the next decade, but that's what needs to happen. Uh, we need to remove most of the CO2, and the sooner we can do that, the cooler Earth's surface will be the less will be emitted by permafrost and other soils. So it's a, the sooner we can get our act together to start removing CO2, the better. <clears throat> Personal choices, many things you can do, and I think almost all of you are already doing some of them. Actually, probably most of you are already doing most of them. Uh, the most important, I think, that most of us can do, especially on a one, two, five year time scale, is don't oversize our vehicles and make them efficient. And I bet many of you already do that. The rest of them, I bet most of you do them as well. At home, make your home efficient. Generally that means well insulated. Don't generate unnecessary heat. Uh, we installed a heat pump almost two years ago. We buy solar from the uh, community farm over in Spencer. Uh, we also buy 100% wind energy and have for many years. Uh, we haven't had an incandescent light bulb in our home for 20 years. Uh, front load clothes washers, of course. Um, Jane air dries her clothes, I doubt. <laughs> and Jane's is a wonderful, wonderful gardener. Jane's my wife over there. <laughs> And honeycomb window shades, I don't know if very many of you are familiar, but they have an R value about three. If you do a couple of them, R value five, you put them up during the day or uh, put them down at night or vice versa, depending on what you need. I recommend them highly if you don't already have them. Food. Uh, some people have put our food as high as a third of our emissions. Uh, it's not something I'm an expert on, but I do know what's healthy, and that producing fruits and veggies is a tiny fraction of the energy used for producing meat. And I also eat healthy, and 60% and fruit and veggies is what I do. Um, many of you know that beef is very high calorie and the most inefficient way to get the calories you need. The grass-fed beef, there's something to be said for that to the extent that that can use to be uh, put carbon back in the soil. We'll talk about that later. Travel choices. Your car, or maybe your truck or van, uh, pickup truck, if you need to use that for work, so be it. Make it efficient. If you don't need it for work, don't get it. <laughs> get a car. 
a uh, few tips there, minor things. Uh, in businesses, uh, business, many businesses are falling over themselves to be more green than their neighbors. Uh, good advertising and so forth. Open the windows at night when it's cooler outside and you want to cool down. You can do that as a business as well as your home. Heat pumps are very important. Uh, efficient lighting, efficient computers. I think most computers these days are pretty efficient. Desktops are becoming relatively rare. Price electricity right, highest when it costs a lot to make. Used to say uh, lowest at night, highest during the day, and highest on hot afternoons. With the penetration of solar, sometimes it's electricity is cheapest in the afternoon when the sun shines. And so I've had to rearrange what I say there a little bit. And as solar is increasing penetration, there are a lot of interesting things happening in California around that. So a little bit more about transportation. It's, e it, it's fairly easy to cut CO2 by 50% in 20 years. GM did that in Europe. Uh, the average personal vehicle miles per gallon in the United States, the most recent year I've been able to find, is 21 miles per gallon. A lot of SUVs, vans, and pickups, bigger than they need to be. Uh, there is work that requires vans and pickups, but there's a lot more pickups and vans than the work that's required for them. Electric vehicles are our future. Right now, they're a bit on the too expensive side, but their estimates for when they become cheaper uh, life cycle than gasoline power vehicles range from 2022 to 2028. Uh, there are a couple of countries India is not going to sell gasoline power vehicles after 2030, Norway 2025. The U.S. risks getting behind in some of the technologies in the future with what Trump has done. Uh, but he has limited ability to override the market. And, yeah. Rural transit, where we are, uh, <coughs> we have bus twice a day from Brookfield to uh, Worcester, but it's uh, flexible mini buses and I think in the future they may be robo vehicles on demand. Uh, electrify your trucks and especially electrify your railroads. <coughs> Run those electricity on renewable energy or at least non-carbon sources, mostly renewable. So overview of electricity where I've spent most of my career. Coal, use less and phase it out. There will be a penalty because we'll have fewer, less SO2 and there's a bump up in the near term, but it's worth it in the long term. <clears throat> a lot of energy store, lots is happening in energy storage, lickety split. Uh, and it will accelerate. Lots of wind power. The United States has, at this point, about a third as much wind power capacity as coal power, power capacity, and gets about a quarter as much, a fifth as much energy from wind as it does from coal although by the end of the year it might be a quarter. Uh, nuclear plants have their problems, they have their, they have their benefits, and I'm not a fan of shutting down existing plants early, because we may need them in winter and other times when the sun doesn't shine and the wind is not blowing. But we can pr pretty much run the U.S. on renewable energy almost, almost entirely by 2050 and do that cost effectively at a lower cost than using fossil fuels. That's becoming increasingly apparent in the United States and it's even more apparent in China and India. China's putting in more renewable energy by 2030 than the United States has electric generating capacity period. And India's putting half that much in by 2030. So taking carbon out of the air, this is the name of the game. This is the name of the game. Many methods, there are about six ways to do it, five ways to do it biologically. This is number one, often called holistic management. There's plenty of questions about whether this is actually effective at all. Uh, the carbon going into the ground deep in the roots, is that more than the carbon the cattle are belching out? It's also possible to manage your grazing lands ineffectively and put too many cattle there without doing the right things and moving them around. So it's very easy to do it wrong. There's a recent article about four months ago in the Sierra Club magazine that talked about that. Um, anyway, 
farming done right can take almost one ton of carbon per acre out of the year. The uh, research in California, Central Valley, I think had 0.7 uh, tons per acre per year. Uh, <coughs> a couple of a couple of years ago that came out. So what you do is no-till farming and compost cover, which is most of what you do with organic farming. You need to rebuild soil carbon levels to what they were before we started farming. Um, I think we can accelerate that. Usually it takes a long time. We may be able to accelerate it. I don't know how much. Third method is biochar. Biochar is very good at staying keeping carbon in the ground for hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of years even. It requires more, in, uh, more human intervention to take carbon and convert it into charcoal. Basically biochar is charcoal. And charcoal is a wonderful thing for keeping water. So in, whenever you get more carbon in your soil, it's very much better at holding on to water and makes things drought resistant. <clears throat> okay, non-biological methods mostly speeding up the rock weathering process. Uh, weathering happens when carbonic acid in raindrops, very weak acid, uh, contacts the surface of rocks and forms carbonate through chemical reactions that the rocks are not already saturated with carbon. Some rocks are pretty saturated and others are not so saturated. What you want to do is increase the surface area so that happens a lot more. And then there are the methods that were pioneered on smokestacks. You run the CO2 and other air out of the smokestack through something that has chemicals called amines. They absorb the CO2 with the amines. You run that stuff into a different chamber. You reverse the conditions. The CO2 comes out and then you pump the CO2 someplace and put it deep underground. Turns out deep underground works very, very well. They've done experiments in Iceland and uh, Western Wash what Eastern Washington near Spokane that have uh, done that very well and shown that within two years it's all carbonate rock. Uh, you can cut it up into dust, you can make it in gravel in silos, you can do artificial trees. There are a lot of people working on this. They're not getting paid for it is the problem. That's one of the reasons we need a price on removing CO2 from the air. How much each of these will do, we don't know. And I can't pick the winners and losers, but we can set the price signals and let the market determine that. Farming the oceans, the idea from the guy I started college with 51 years ago. Uh, you have not just open ocean, but you have pans that are segregated. You treat those in an industrial way with the fertilizers they need. Then you turn the algae that grows as a result into biochar. You sink the biochar, the ash remains on the surface to be recycled as more fertilizer. Planting trees is a great idea. Unfortunately, I don't think in the long term it will work very well as you have more evaporation and less, uh, less water in the soils. I hope it does, but I'm not, that's not where I'd be placing, that's not the basket I'd be placing my eggs in. But I might be pleasantly surprised, I don't know. So positive signs, world CO2 emissions did peak five years ago. They're down maybe one and a half to two percent since then. Uh, that's according to the U.S. Department of Energy. CO2 emissions piked in China five years ago, maybe in India five years ago, U.S. 10 years ago, European Union 14. Oil majors already use shadow prices for carbon in deciding which projects to do. Uh, they're in favor of, uh, car of carbon tax. That's especially true in Europe, but it's also becoming true in the United States for oil companies. Leading economists are behind a carbon tax 100%. So are major, some of the major Republican players in the past, including Secretary of State and Treasury, Schultz and uh, Baker, Treasury Paulson. Walton was head of Walmart for 25 years. Um, corporate America is against Trump on climate change and a lot of these companies have already committed to going 100% renewable. Many of them are pushing for a carbon tax. We had the most recent round of that, I think, uh, this week on Monday. Maybe it was the week before. I was in Washington lobbying for carbon tax then. So here's a, a small list of the companies that are committed already going 100% renewable. It's lower price risk and it's going to be cheaper relying on fossil fuels, and they know that. 
Uh, used to be we had more investment in fossil fuels. The crossover point was 2014, and non-fossil fuels are winning, going away. Investment in fossil fuels is, coal is dead, uh, except for the next five years, maybe in Indonesia and Turkey. Uh, solar power is now cheaper than coal power in India, and they've really reversed themselves in spades in the last seven months. China's reversed themselves about five years ago. So for the summary, we need to go carbon negative before 2050 and big time thereafter. That's my website. It's on the business card that's in the uh, case there with your CD. It's also uh, the final slide on your CD. And I have several different presentations, the final one there. That website has everything that's on your CD and more. It has thousands of, well, more than a thousand illustrations. And I update it every week. Your CD is just one snapshot at one point in time. The other thing I would say again is get involved. There are many things you can do as individuals, but the most important thing we do is put a price on carbon and make sure that price rises over time. It doesn't have to be that high to start out with, but it does have to be rising and it has to be rising steadily, predictably, so business can plan on that. And we as individuals can plan on that. So thank you very much for your time. Everybody did pick up the. Um, just grab yours here. This, this is has a few of the things that Dr. Fry was talking about about things you can do uh, in your own household. Uh, it also talks about some things we can do in Massachusetts and things you can do nationally. So that's just the beginning of a list of things that you could you could list a whole lot of things you can do. But um, uh, I hope that everybody will take from this program a, a willingness to to be engaged in this movement of uh, addressing climate change and that they will feel that even as an individual, you're important. Remember, our whole planet is made up of a whole bunch of individuals. So uh, if all the individuals start doing what they need to do and uh, talking to politicians and doing things in their own household, uh, we can make a big difference. Um, some of the things that, doc, uh, that Senator Bobby talked about, uh, legislation, um, at the state level, um, and I think Dr. Fry mentioned it too, we may have to do some things at the state level sort of to lead the way at the national level. The, sometimes the states are ahead, and as we know, since President Trump withdrew from the uh, Paris Accord, a number of states have stepped forward and said, okay, you withdrew, but our state isn't withdrawing. We're going we're gonna to meet those targets, and uh, I think that the more states will do that, the better. Massachusetts um, is one that has said we will meet the targets. So uh, sometimes we have to we have to start little and and push those people in Washington to do what they should be doing. So um, what I would like to do is open this up for any questions for Dr. Fry. True. What? Um, what? Yeah. Could I have just one minute? No, you can't have. That. <laughs> <laughs> of course, as, as the other half of the family. <laughs> yes. So Jean addresses policy more than I do, but I address the education piece. I know there are teachers here. So if you are a teacher or have friends or neighbors who are, I do have a handout here with some of the selected top resources in climate change education. And I also have those resources around the edge on a table, so you can take a peek at those if you'd like. But there's this handout that you're welcome to take. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, know, I know one of the teachers uh, two of the teachers in the audience are my son and daughter-in-law, so I know they so will be taking advantage of that. And um, I, I so would remind you also there are places to sign up if you're interested in working on carbon pricing. Yes. Um, okay, Sarah, did you? I just wondered if, if Jean, if you could address the idea of the rebates that's connected with the bills that are being proposed. Oh yes. Uh, so the carbon is sometimes called a revenue neutral carbon tax and sometimes it's called carbon fee and dividend. So the idea that's being pushed both by the Republicans, uh, elder statesmen, and by lots of companies like ExxonMobil and Walmart and uh, 
Microsoft and Apple is for we call it a revenue neutral carbon tax. That's what uh, Rex Tillerson at Exxon Mobil, now it's Secretary of State, called it nine years ago. What happens is you put a price on carbon and the the money is comes in either at the wellhead or at the mouth of the coal mine or at the point of entry if you're importing oil or possibly natural gas. And that money comes into the treasury and then the money goes out uh, one month, three months later, sometimes a year later, depending on the proposal, in equal amounts to all the taxpayers. Uh, some variations have businesses receiving some of that, usually on a per employee basis. Those are the bills in Massachusetts and at least one of the bills, no, I should just say the one in Massachusetts, the ones in Massachusetts. Um, and the rest is split evenly. Sometimes every citizen or every resident, one proposal is a complicated formula that's per household. But anyway, let, let's do the simple version which says every resident gets an equal share. So say I pay in a year maybe $300 more because the price of carbon is now incorporated. But if, if, if I don't use a lot of carbon, I'll get $400 back in rebates to pay for that. If I use a lot of carbon, uh, I might pay $2,000 in higher prices from carbon. The individual probably wouldn't pay that much. Uh, maybe seven, $800. And I'd still get back $400, so I'd be worse off. Uh, generally, poor people can't afford to buy as much, and they can't afford to buy as much gasoline, space heating. They can't afford to buy big houses that require more heating. They don't buy big cars. Uh, they don't usually jet other parts of the world. And most poor people, especially those in cities where there's mass transit, buses and subways to get to places, or they walk, or the bicycle, um, will get more money in their carbon dividend than they would pay in higher prices. Uh, here in rural Massachusetts, uh, we don't have access very much to mass transit. The uh, bill, particularly Senator Barrett's bill in the Senate, provides <coughs> extra dividend for people in rural areas who do not have access to mass transit. That about 30%, I remember the number 30% being involved, but I can't really tell you the details about it. Um, so that if we have to lo drive long distances to work or to shopping or even to go testify on, uh, at the state house, <laughs> we're somewhat comp uh, compensated. Um, I hope that's helpful. Okay, yes sir. Unfortunately, I have to leave, but I wanted to say um, I started teaching my students about um, global warming, climate change, now it's climate di disruption about 21 years ago. And I've seen a lot of these presentations, and Gene does an excellent job with this. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is the average age in here is pretty high. And we really need to get the young people thinking and talking about this. And, and we all are educators. Each one of us has an opportunity to teach everyone, our friends, our neighbors, our grandchildren, whatever, about um, climate disruption and about what can be done. And that there, there's this false alternative. You know, we can either have a you know great booming economy, or we can you know, try to work on the environment, and we can really do both. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to Jean before I had to leave, and hopefully we'll all be teachers and talking to people about this. I have a couple of thoughts in response. One is I've probably handed out seven or 8,000 of these CDs to people under 25. And in the last two or three years, especially as I've been emphasizing removing CO2 more, and I say we need to move beyond carbon neutral to carbon negative, virtually every one of them says, of course. 
there are lots and lots of young people who are, what they need to do is vote. And they're already doing many other kinds of things. They know the climate future is about them. And they are seeking in their own ways to make a low carbon and zero carbon and even negative carbon future happen. There's a lot of energy there. Michael Green, who was a student when I first met him at Poll almost 10 years ago, is head of the Climate Action Business Association. A lot of relatively young people there, average age probably 40, 35 maybe. Uh, people in 350, there are lots and lots of young people there. And there are lots of people our own age there too. I've, I've been to a number of 350 things. I forget what the other thing I was going to say was. Another <laughs> <laughs> question? Yes, ma'am. Could you say some more about biochar and about the uh, algae growing thing? I don't understand how that works. Okay. Can you repeat I'd, the question? Can I say more about biochar and the algae thing? Let me talk about the algae thing, and I don't know if Ted Wysocki wants to talk about biochar. He knows more about it than I do. I'll start with the algae thing. Uh, yeah, uh, so when I showed up at Cornell University for my undergrad degree in 1966, among the people I met there was Bob Showalter, and uh, we intersected again 40 years later through alum alumni kinds of things, and it's his idea. <coughs> What you would do is you would have pans that are a few miles on a side, and they'd probably be mostly around the equator, which is where you get the most sunlight, and what I say, many inches deep. You're not trying to go to the bottom of the ocean, but you do have a bottom so that you contain your fertilizers. And it's not just throwing fertilizers on the ocean and whatever will be, will be. There have been a number of experiments, and that doesn't, that's not very helpful. Uh, but you would run an industrial op operation, and I assume you'd mine some of these uh, phosphor phosphates and various other things on land. You might, I'm not sure where you'd get all your amines and uh, ammonium sulfate or whatever it is the major fertilizers are. Somebody else knows those better than I do. But you'd have ships transport them from the relevant, relevant land, land places out there. Uh, you distribute there, algae will grow lickety split given the number of, given the right conditions. Then you harvest them based on, I, I envision it would be something like you would vacuum them up along the surface. You put them into an oven and you, the oven would be, make sure it's low enough in oxygen so you don't completely burn them. Uh, you convert them to biochar, which is probably not exactly charcoal because they're not big pieces of wood, they're just little algae, but the same general principle. And Bob says uh, biochar is two grams per cubic centimeter and water is one, and they will sink. What you want to do is to have just carbon sink and you collect the phosphorus and potassium and nitrates and whatever else so that you can reuse them for the next batch. And that's really as much as I know about it. Uh, it's not Bob's main gig. His main gig is to make solar cells dirt cheap and run them off printing presses, like printing presses. Uh, Ted Wysocki has been working on biochar for a number of years, and I just got into it when I went to a presentation he made three years ago. Uh, can I talk for a minute or two about biochar? Uh, to answer your question on the algae, you can make biochar out of any biomass providing it's clean, you don't want to use pressure treat lumber or something like that. In the car I have about uh, 15 examples of the different types of biochar. One of them is seaweed, which is algae. We've been able to basically clean up the environment a little bit by vacuuming off the algae, filtering it through, through something that looks like a filter press. It takes the phosphorus with it and the nitrogen with it, and now we can break it up, utilize it as a long-term fertilizer, or take it right out of the water, out of sight. That was kind of like theory, but that's a humongous project, and it has to be continuous, and then you've got to want to do it. So, so uh, I concentrate on doing it locally for sewage treatment plants, and 
uh, farms and farm runoff. And I use biochar to soak up the nitrogen and phosphorus and nutrients. Where is it being done on a larger scale? Uh, right now it's more like grassroots. Uh, so far we've made a lot of the charcoal through the standard methods, which is a Missouri kiln. Uh, they used to do this in Union, Connecticut, the Connecticut charcoal mill. That's where we got our first sample of the material. We certified it, got it through the state, and actually started doing research on it at UMass uh, Small Farms Institute, and uh, we're working with no problem. But that's not where we're I mean, it's uh, something to do with Australia. Dynamotive has done it. Uh, Australia has done a whole bunch of it. They make a, uh, there's a green and gold charcoal that is used for making, uh, growing the cocoa that we like for the green and, is it the green and black or the green and gold right kind of chocolate? But they're using the biochar there. It's made from biomass, uh, sugar cane, I like guess, trees, leaves. So it's charcoal, not ashes? No, when you've got the ash, you've already gotten rid of the carbon. You've okay. already pushed all the carbon down. A lot is happening at grassroots in many places. Uh, Ted was talking about uh, skimming the algae off the surface of lakes. I think somebody was doing it on the surface of Lake Erie, and they had a lot. Mm -hmm. And you converted biochar, and the, new, the ash that's left over the biochar is just the carbon, and the carbon actually can soak up oxygen from the air, and you have almost four times the weight of CO2 removed as you have just the carbon. Um, those are some of the things that said. <laughs> okay, yes sir, back there. Um, Alan Savory gave a talk, a TED talk a few years ago where he was promoting his way of raising cattle in high densities and moving them quickly from place to place where he was reversing desertification. Uh, and you alluded to that with your, buff, your, your discussion. Do you know, have others been uh, pursuing that more? Because it seems to me that if that's feasible, then if we took the money that we're spending on subsidies for corn and soy production and said we'll put that same amount of money into restoring grasslands and, and using his, tech, his type of technique to try to uh, increase the amount of carbon in the soils. Okay, let me repeat the question for those who may not have been able to hear them. Uh, Alan Savory has really pioneered the idea of uh, changing grazing practices so you have a lot of cattle for very short periods of time then you move them around. He had a TED talk uh, several years ago and his general group is called holistic management which is a way of incorporating that fast rotation grazing into the rest of the farming or ranching practices and let's see what I can add to that that's absolutely what I was talking about uh, other people are doing doing it uh, I think the Maddox ranch is one fairly well very well known within the holistic management community I think there's a brand Brown Ranch in the Dakotas somewhere. Um, there are quite a few others. The famous thing that is on my website is a photograph showing holistic management practices on the left in the Karoo Desert and on the right, and you have a lot of grass on the left, and the, the right is uh, mostly bare dirt with scattered uh, something like sagebrush. Um, there's a lot of potential there. There's also potential to do it wrong. I'm not cognizant of the critique in the, the Sierra Club article that came out about three or four months ago. Um, and I think setting a price on verified CO2 removal, we'll see how well that works. The people who practice holistic management have all kinds of side benefits, much better water availability in the soil and much greater biodiversity with uh, various grasses, birds, butterflies. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I think there may be people in this room, I saw two of them nodding, 
who know about, at least more about it than I do. Um, I hope that's of some help anyway. Now this is probably one of those areas where a combination of um, the economics of it with uh, driving it, that, that people are more likely to buy beef that has been raised this way, um, and also probably some governmental incentives in the terms in terms of, uh, of subsidy programs, as you're suggesting over there, that the, the idea of giving subsidies for for doing something this way rather than giving subsidies for either not growing something or growing something that is much less efficient in terms of the food chain. So um, it's probably a, a multi, uh, mm -hmm. multi-faceted approach to something like that. Um, yeah? Um, I don't know if you know this, but the solar salt um, industry is sort of looking at using the ability to do solar or electricity production at night using the salts. Ah, okay. uh, yep. What's the, is there a push for in the southwest U.S. to increase the output? The general idea is that you use a whole mirror field to reflect light up to a central tower that's got these salts that hold onto the heat all nighting and they can boil the water and make electricity. I know that it's being used in Spain, but uh, is that a, something that's on kind of the renewable um. US it seems like I saw an article in the last couple of months that some outfit is uh, planning to do that again. The power towers, which are using the mirrors to focus on the basically steam generation thing up on the top of the tower and then push, pump the seat down to uh, produce electricity, have generally there, there are cheaper ways to do it now. Okay. And the photovoltaics have generally won out and the power tower kinds of things are smaller. But the, I don't think the molten salt is dead. Uh, that's a, that's a, a pretty good way to store it for later on the night. And I think that's probably going to become even more important. <coughs> Basically your s solar energy peaks at solar noon. And you can change that a little bit by pointing your uh, solar cells southwest instead of south. But even then, the especially on the hot days, your peak demand for electricity may be 5, 6, 7, even 8 or 9 p.m. That's happening a lot in California. They've got something called the duck curve. And what you need is a way to store energy. And there are many ways to store energy. Uh, batteries are the most famous one, but they're there, you can also pump water uphill like we do at Northfield Mountain. And you can compress air. You do that inside caverns. That's often used with wind power, places on the Great <coughs> Plains. But I think there's a fair amount of potential. I don't know how much for molten salt storage. But I think that would probably be very well paired with solar energy production when on hot days when your peaks are Five, five to nine, or even ten p.m. That's that's my opinion, but the the market will figure that out. <laughs> uh, question back here: Was somebody had their hand up earlier? Did you that have your hand? Oh, I, I did. Um, although I think Mr. Could you Kinsaki, could you stand up and, and talk a little louder so we can all hear? Uh, yeah. My my question was was actually a follow-on to the char. Uh, and related to how much outreach is going on through, say, like local agricultural councils and the like, because they seem like they would be a natural multiplier for getting that idea out there, and then perhaps working with the state to get some incentives for small farmers to be doing that. <coughs> I didn't know if, if we've hit the local level with that yet. We have reached out to the farmers We've uh, had our own group, we call it Bio, uh, Pioneer Valley Biochar Initiative. This has morphed uh, and split apart into different groups, but we went to Climate Action Now, and we're all taking part in our own little areas of expertise. Now, we try to get the, uh, NOFA and farmers interested in the economics of it, because we found out we ran an economic analysis about four years ago. Uh, we had an intern from Ukraine come in. She was going to do her doctorate's thesis. She came in and said, okay, if the value of biochar was equal dollar for dollar per pound uh, to fertilizer, then 
in the first year you probably it'd be a wash you'd save probably 30 percent of the fertilizer that you would have put down it would have stayed longer it would have had better in the soil the second and third and fourth years the additive value is now making money back for you using less fertilizer applying less time in the fields and time is money and especially when you have either a dust bowl or you got a swamp for, you know, for a field. Uh, I've already no longer had that problem. I put charcoal in the soil and it doesn't matter. It used to wash away and I'd have to truck the garden back up the hill. It does not occur anymore. No matter how much torrential rain. So it sounds like local, local farm applications are... Sounds like it's farther west and I'm, I'll get with you after to try to get it a little more yeah, essential local, mass. Local lady, lady over here and then the gentleman here in back. Dr. Fry, can you say something about how helpful you might think it would be to have a vegan diet? Well, I think a vegan diet would be very helpful for the climate. It's also generally mm -hmm. healthier for the person who has that diet. Um, vegan means you're all, all vegetables, not even, or not vegetables and fruit, not even uh, eggs and dairy, in addition to not meat and fish. And I haven't researched personally what fraction of our energy goes to getting food. I have heard numbers as high as a third. I, it seems a little high for me, but it might be true. And a vegan diet, I would gather, if everybody on Earth, all the people on Earth were vegan, I would guess we would cut our energy use for food by a half to two thirds. In the United States, where meat is, and dairy is much more common than in many other parts of the world, probably much more than two thirds, probably maybe more than three quarters. Uh, it's also been said somebody on a vegan diet on average lives seven years longer than somebody who isn't. That may be because they are also helpful in other ways, they're less likely to smoke, etc., etc. But uh, in general, as long as you watch your vitamin B12 and your protein balances, uh, there's a lot of wonderful things to be said for a vegan diet. And again, eating lower on the, the the closer you come to that, the healthier you are, and the healthier the planet is. Thank you. Uh, many of the examples you gave about uh, how it, uh, how change can occur are either individual, or corporate, or statewide or national. Yeah. Do you know of any examples where communities, or the communities, let's say, represented by this group? might have adopted the same agenda of saying uh, zero carbon growth or carbon reduction that we could say as Brookfield or the Brookfields or Brookfields enlarged, we're all going to now devote ourselves in a concerted way to measuring our output and reducing it over the course of 30 years, whatever it would be. There are uh, a number of cities and towns I don't know how many places like Berkeley, Fort Collins come to mind. I think I've seen several other names, but I can't. But those are just ones in the United States, by the way. There are a lot of other ones in other countries that have committed to go 100% renewable energy or carbon free by such and such date. And I think that's something that's feasible for a place like uh, Brookfield or the Brookfields or whatever to do. Uh, and I think actually, given the economics of power production, it's a very sensible thing to do. Sticking with fossil fuels is more expensive than going renewable. And that's, that's changed compared to what it was five years ago. That's a very fundamental change, as what China and India are doing is also almost the reverse of what they were doing five years ago. <coughs> My daughter lives in Fort Collins, and she sent me an article about um, research on making a machine, a device that will undergo or mimic um, photosynthesis, 
and creating a product using solar energy. Have you heard anything relative to that? Um, it seems like I saw something once or twice. It's just at the edge of my awareness of having an artificial photosynthesis that uh, takes solar energy and converts it to things. Um, I, I know I, I know essentially nothing, though. Uh, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> well, when we were talking about the community aspect, it reminded me that there is something called the Green Communities Act, which was passed in 1996. And I was just looking it up, and there is a coordinator who's supposed to be able to help us assist our municipality in becoming energy efficient. And there's four of them in the state, so we should definitely look into that, reach out to that person. They have grants and all kinds of stuff. I don't know much more than what I just read. Certainly there are a lot of towns that have uh, installed solar farms on their um, Cap landfills, including Brookfield, has done that. It doesn't take care of all of the energy for the school and the town hall and everything, but it's a good a good chunk. Um, and that's, I think, one of the kinds of things. I, uh, Senator Govey mentioned a, uh, the sort of frustration of the plastic bag industry that all these towns have different standards where you can get rid of plastic bags, but or you can have them, but they can be this or that. And and how good it would be, they, the industry would rather have a, a standard and. Uh, so that's maybe something that, that uh, individual towns can do is to advocate for something like a statewide standard on something like plastic bags. Um, so it's not an energy production thing, but it is, it is meaning you're not spending energy or uh, on making bags and you're not, uh, you're not filling landfills and, and other places roadsides with plastic. I, I know, Dr. you can't see us on the side of the room. There's several of us who are anxious to get your attention. Let's see. I don't know if it's you two is first. Or later. Doesn't matter. Well, it's a good segue to the plastic bag. Um, I don't know how much of a, an impact packaging has. We had it as one of the things we can do, less packaging, you know, less uh, pa plastic bags. So the convenience of having things like Amazon and light companies mailing not only the box to your house, the thousands of boxes that arrive every day to everybody's house, but the peanuts, the styrofoam peanuts and the little puffy plastic thingies, the airbags, airbags, whatever they are, is there, I mean, it's only getting greater and greater. The malls are shutting down. Everybody knows this. Amazon has, what, three? three facilities in the state now is that right or, or they're building the third and this is only going to grow and grow and grow so you know talk about young people and teaching young people and reaching them well they're doing it we're doing it everybody's doing it how do we um, limit that or I mean I don't see a, I don't see a stop to it I just see that as you know more filling up the landfills, more uh, polluting our environment. I, I just don't know how, how people, um, how you can reconcile that. I mean, I'm guilty too. I do minimal, but I do it. And um, I, I mean, I'm guilty, but I, I just, how do we stop this? Can I actually it, address that one? We can all certainly do it on an individual basis and, and pledge ourselves to shopping locally. Mm. Um, I think. Can, can we talk to the senior management at Amazon? Amazon is a big outfit, and I think some other corporations might follow. Mike, Mike, but what are they going to do? They're not going to stop shipping. Oh, not gonna I, I think they may switch to cornstarch peanuts, and I certainly had those. And they might get outer packages, which are virtually the same size as the inner packages, so they're not having. They're not filling it with the little air bubble packs. Two-thirds of the things that have air bubble packs don't need air bubble packs. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, well, just my personal opinion. Uh, here and then, yeah. Actually, I was just going to, oh, if you don't mind, I just wanted to build on that, is that Amazon is very cost aware, okay? I, I worked for Amazon for about just short of two years. 
which uh, is like 14 years in human years. <laughs> and uh, uh, anything that we can do as consumers to communicate to Amazon that you're more willing to do business with them and as the technologies get better for like the cornstarch packaging to, to Jean's point, it, the market starts to make that decision for them. Okay, I can tell you right now, they've been working on the making packages actually fit the stuff better since 2004 when I worked for them because of sheer cost. If the dimensions on the package are smaller, they spend less money to UPS and FedEx. And they are a business that's all about the pennies. Okay, so if every time you get a package from them, you send back to them a complaint that says the package was oversized and it had six times as many bubbles as what it needed, people read that. There's real honest to goodness human beings that process that feedback, okay? And they will go, gee, that's costing me 50 cents plus the money for somebody to read the comment every time I do that. And, and it starts to drive behavior at the corporations. I want to build on something you said there about people read that. Uh, <laughs> Who do politicians pay the most attention to? Number one on their list is their constituents contacting them. That's even more important usually than their funders. And I hear that again and again at the national level. I hear it at the state level. Politicians listen. They don't get a lot of feedback from their constituents. So everybody who does say something represents a lot of people. You can have a lot of influence. I'm the one person you won't have any trouble hearing today. <laughs> uh, I'm also a teacher like Ian and, and have been. Uh, I also serve as the Democratic State Committee person for Ian's 29 Towns, and I'm a town moderator in Spencer. Uh, I'm going to ask our website person to put a lot of these practical suggestions on our, on our own Democratic Town website. As a member of the Rural Issues Subcommittee for the party, I'm, I'm very interested in this whole uh, take, put the carbon back in the soil and take it out. All the discussions I've heard the party had to this point have been about just stopping to put it in. We, we have not had the discussion about how you take it out. And I think there's a whole p potential for incentives for farmers in this charcoal thing mm. to uh, make a huge difference in this area. So. Um, I'd be very interested in future forums to hear much more about that because I'm looking to see how we can put that into action on the state level. Uh, I do need to go to some other events, but this is exciting. Keep involved, and Spencer is very excited to work in our own way with Brookfield to, to move forward on this. And we, we have had a few people have to leave. I just, before, we'll take a couple more questions, but before that, I want to make sure that we acknowledge the people who put this whole event together, who were yes. responsible for, besides Jean, obviously, who was at the core of the presentation, we, there's a lot of logistics that went into us, and, and uh, the chairman, uh, for the moment anyway, of our Environment Subcommittee, uh, Sarah Heller, and Jean had great help on the publicity front, particularly from uh, Danielle Kane, who <laughs> a lot of other people, we had, there were several other people who really put in a lot of time, not just on refreshments, which I hope you will all enjoy or have enjoyed, um, but on thinking through things, on giving Gene feedback on his presentation, on all aspects of this. So, Cindy Brown, Nancy Tame, Karen Erickson, Donna Mancuso, thank you so much for everything you've done to, to make this a success. <laughs> Two more questions and, and then... Young man with glasses. <laughs> uh, yeah, the follow-up to the Amazon uh, discussion, I wondered if there have been any studies about whether it's better for me to, like I did today, I had to drive to Clems and Tractor Supply for two items. Is it better for me to buy those on Amazon? I don't know. I'm not <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like a reasonable study because I, I, I feel like I probably used a heck of a lot more carbon driving to Leicester than had I had something delivered by somebody who's delivering a thousand other packages. I've certainly had those thoughts many times. Yeah. <laughs> Regina? Well, I. 
I'm, I'm sort of prejudiced in this respect. Um, we have a small business, and um, Amazon is pretty well put all book businesses out of business. But what they do instead is they charge you to put the books on their platform, then somebody sees them and buys them, which is great, and then the book dealer packages it, ships it, puts it in the box, pays the postage, and Amazon takes most of the profit. So I know that's a different issue than the environmental issue, but I also think that if we want to buy local and keep our um, small towns kind of vibrant, that if we can buy locally and keep our businesses intact in our area, it creates greater community. Amazon is, is really creating situations similar to Walmart where nobody owns a business. You basically work in a very low wage way for a gigantic corporation who doesn't treat their employees very well, but also doesn't treat their supplier. So we have become a supplier for the product that you see on Amazon and that might sell for $25 and we might get two. Um, sure, and uh, that's why I went to Clem's first. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why they were, and they were sold out. So yeah. and, uh, uh, I did skip over Walmart and went to Jack Your Fist. It's a fishy cycle yeah. because as they take more business, the, the box stores can <laughs> supply as well. It, it, it's a vicious cycle, but I think it cuts us off from one another and it, it kind of wrecks <laughs> in my opinion, not, not just the book business, but you look at pharmacies or you look at clothing stores or shoe stores, they're all gone. Um, so that's a, it's not so much environmental, but I do think it fits in the sense of the idea of buying local and having that sense of community as we do with, as we're moving toward the food. I think if we can preserve our small community businesses, there's a value in that. Well, and the sense of community, too, can, can lead to groups like this getting together with common purpose of over a lot of things, not just buying local, but acting together on issues and, and being, being a voice of many people um, with, you know, speaking with one voice about an issue. So, so uh, the sense of community is really important uh, on, across the board in our lives. So. Did you have a question over here that we skipped over at that table somewhere? No? Okay. Carol? Um, you talked about a carbon tax, and I, I, I'm curious, uh, would that be something that would be enacted by Congress, or what? I mean, uh, who would do this? Because I don't have a lot of hope for this, you know, Congress and this president don't really even believe that we have a problem and that there is climate change, so. Okay. Uh, primarily, it would be enacted by the U.S. Congress. Individual states can do it, but it's, it's really, a national and international problem and if you had a couple individual states that put more pressure and they do it in different ways that puts pressure on Congress to do a uniform thing across the country uh, right now the in the House of Representatives the committees are headed by uh, guys from Texas who's anti-science and uh, in the pocket of oil and gas industries the majority leader in the Senate is coal country um, and Congress is a bit of a tough nut to crack with the current leadership. The good news about Congress is there's a lot of stuff happening in the back benches. Some of it overt and some of it covert. Overtly, Climate Solutions Caucus was started um, roughly two years ago by a Democrat and Republican to say, we want to take a look at climate solutions. These are in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, by the end of last session, it grew to 10 of each. They have a rule, one Republican for each one Democrat. There's a long waiting list of Democrats to get in. <laughs> <laughs> then the elections happened, some people ran for the Senate, some retired, one or two got defeated, and got down to nine Democrats and six Republicans. And that's how it was uh, with the new Congress that got inaugurated in January 20 or whenever they started. And it is now up, the last I heard, to 22 or 23 of each. 
so they're talking with each other and <clears throat> some of the more vocal people may hate each other guts but these people are talking <laughs> civilly to each other <laughs> there is a middle and the middle are talking courteously and they want to get things done most republicans in congress know that there is climate change and that it's real and that humans have a lot to do with it. I would say that characterizes the majority of the Republican members of Congress. Uh, what to do about it is there's less consensus on. The obvious thing is to put a revenue neutral tax on carbon. You've got major Republican leaders, uh, Rex Tillerson, James Baker, George Shultz, Henry Paulson. You've got two Republican chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Greg Mankiw and Felds, Marty Feldstein. I think I've left somebody out, but there are a lot of major, and you've got Nobel Prize winners, Republicans from beer like David Stiglitz and some others who say this is the way to go. The Republic, I remember three years ago, <coughs> my first time in Washington lobbying for carbon tax, and one of the five people I met with was for uh, staffer for a conservative Republican from North Carolina. He said, if you, get, if you come back, uh, if you get back here, contact us, we'd like to talk with you about the science. So I did. Uh, I was back again in November. I go twice a year, June and November. <clears throat> the first words out of his mouth was, we agree with you on the science. How does this work? They weren't going to say publicly we agree with you on the science. Uh, it's as Barack Obama said a oh, year, year and a half ago, there's a cha primary challenge on the right. So there are a lot of things they can't say. They need to not get too far ahead of their constituents, and they listen to their constituents. What are their constituents saying? Who's contacting them? Citizen Climate Lobby now has chapters that cover every district in Congress, uh, in the House of Representatives, and they probably have district or membership headquarters, like I go to the one in uh, Lexington. There's not one here in Brookfield or even Worcester. Maybe we should start one here. Uh, but there's one in that's headquartered in about 500 of the 538 congressional districts. There's a lot of covert support in Congress. Uh, Republicans are caught up in no new taxes. And they've had mantras and those get ratified. There are a couple of such resolutions in the last Congress and the comment from the legislative director of the National Citizen Climate Lobby is, well, I wouldn't want the carbon tax they're railing against either. We want ours to be revenue neutral, which is not what they were talking about in that particular resolution. So I think the question, it's going to happen and it's going to go from impossible to inevitable very quickly. The question is, when does that very quickly happen? I have some hopes, they're not high, that Trump will use getting out of the Paris Climate Accord to say, hey, let's do this right. Let's do a revenue neutral carbon tax. That's what the economists are saying. Um, I'm not counting on that. I have not written off that possibility. I think it's a little bit more possible that Democrats take control of the House in 2018. Uh, I think everybody out there in the political world knows this is the way to go. Barack Obama wanted to do that, but it couldn't get the vote, so he had to go regulation. Uh, you've got major companies all around the world who are advocating this. Uh, none of the government, well, very few of the governments, provincial level governments and a few national governments are doing this, but the big players, China, seems to be going cap and trade. No. In the meantime, while we're waiting for the federal government to do something, we can do something here in Massachusetts because there's those two bills that have a good chance of passing. One of the things we have to do is, is lobby and Gobi. She is on the uh, Telecommunications, Utility, and Energy su uh, Joint Subcommittee, which is the next hurdle for the bill. And she has not come out in favor of this. And as she was saying today, she's got some reservations about the carbon pricing because she's focusing on the tax aspect of it and she w there is the tax as aspect but it is neutralized by the rebates so 
so you know we need to we need to work on Anne and, and get her to see the light. <laughs> we should also work on the East County Barricade. I met for 40 minutes on Tuesday with this staff person. With who? Oh, Johnny. 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 My state rep. My state representative. Uh, I think there may be a couple of different state representatives. Yeah. Work on our state representatives. She was very interested when I laid out essentially what you've seen today. Uh, not all of it, but most of it. And uh, clearly, and said, Donnie Bertelm is very interested in climate. I think he's concerned. The question is, can they find the political cover to do what's needed? And part of the political cover is saying, my constituents are asking for it. I'm getting letters from so-and-so. I'm getting calls from so-and-so. You, as constituents, have immense power to make things happen in the state legislature. Um, Nancy has had her hand up for a while. So yes. Um, one of the things that I learned about carbon pricing um, was that economically it's actually a plus. So we could sell it by saying that um, Massachusetts doesn't make any fossil fuels. We don't have oil wells, we don't have coal mines, and we don't have fracked gas here. We import all of that. We import it from somebody across the sea, from some other state. And it's $20 billion that we spend to import it. So if we didn't import that into our state, we would have $20 billion more to spend on renewables and on research for renewables and on starting new companies. Um, and that would give us more jobs. So there is an economic incentive. There are studies to back that up. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, we could sell it as a you know, job maker, job Absolutely. creator. Absolutely. I mean, I can see here we have solar panels and, and windmills going up. And so, yes, it's, you know, there's money to be made in the solar wind uh, renewable market. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And the other thing was with the rebates, you touched on it, the idea that it's it's a little bit of redistribution of wealth, which nobody likes to hear, but the poorer people get a net benefit from the rebate. And so they and they tend to spend most of their money. They don't save it. So it does it does uh, stimulate the economy. So there's another aspect to the whole thing. It seems like such a beautiful way to use market forces to get us to do the right thing. I, I, Maybe one more question. I, I wanted to add a little bit more before that question. Okay. Uh, another point, as you write to your state representative as well as the Ann Golden State Senator, is there are co-benefits. Not only does it grow the economy, which is by about half a percent, and it create jobs, which is another half a percent relative to not having it, there are also health benefits spin-offs. Uh, you're burning less fossil fuels, less natural gas. There are all kinds of good things that happen when you have less of that. Um, One more. My understanding is that um, Senator Goldie is in favor of this, but that she's got a lot of pushback from other constituents. Um, and I think rather, well, in addition to getting in touch with her, we need to do the dreadful, scary thing and talk to our neighbors. And <laughs> like Elizabeth Warren said, yeah, you're going to have to start talking to your brother-in-law again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, we, if we need to explain to as many people as we can um, why this would be a good thing um, so that then she gets letters from people who aren't traditionally, you know, retired liberals and you know, a better cross-section, especially in this western part of the state where so many people are, um, you know, commuting so far and, you know, putting, using so much um, just to, to, to live your daily life. Um, it's easier for people in Lexington to get behind something like this than people that live you know, out in Pittsfield and, and Rowe and, you know, Shelburne and, and the, you know, you think we got it bad. It's really tough well, out there. The, the gentleman who's a, a teacher who made the point that we 
we all need to become educators and, and, exactly, and yeah. talk to our brother-in-law again. Yes, we need to, we, <laughs> we need to not be afraid to uh, talk to people that we think might not agree with us and uh, talk to them in a non-confrontational, non-adversarial non way and try to share information and to under try to understand what their points of view are and why they think what they think. I think. Uh, the return of some kind of uh, general civility in public discourse and even in in one-on-one uh, -on -one private discourse with, with people you don't agree with is, is one of the things that will help us to get through any number of things we're, we're trying to deal with now on the on the state and national scene. So um, I would encourage everybody to, to take a deep breath and talk to somebody that uh, you haven't talked to in a while. Yeah. There's a summary of the economic case for it. Just, just a little anecdote. Uh, my wife and I were eating at a restaurant, and the owner of the restaurant came over and was talking with us. And he's more business-minded and was not convinced about global warming issues and stuff. I brought up the fact that I said we well, have the different planets. You have Mercury and Venus and Earth, and that what's what's the? I asked him what he thought. Who, which planet was the hottest planet? And you'd think, well, you'd think Mercury would be the hottest because it's the closest to the sun, right? Well, no, Mercury is not the hottest planet. Venus is the, the, by far the hottest planet, and it's so hot on the surface that you can melt lead. And, and the reason is because of the greenhouse effect that it's all this very high concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, he immediately said, oh, he, that convinced them just there. So. You know, you, you, you say, well, we can say what's happening here on Earth, but we can also look at what's happening in other planets. You know? He canceled his plans to retire on Venus. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you on your oh, CD. Great. Mm -hmm. So uh, please take those and share them with, with everyone you know. There are extra mm -hmm. copies on the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We do have refreshments mm -hmm. back there for mm -hmm. those who mm -hmm. have taken mm -hmm. advantage of it. There are bathrooms down this way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Stay around and have some